On today's show, we'll be talking about Finelli's Italian Villa and addressing a tough question. All that and more coming up now on Joy in the City True Stories. Joy in the City is a program highlighting people and organizations that are having an impact on our city. All too often, we hear about the problems and the dysfunction in our culture, but we are coming with a different approach as we take a look at the good things that are going on right here in our community. I'm Lindsay Irvin, and you're about to see what God is doing in our city. We want to thank our program sponsors, Park Home, for the donation of furniture used in our studio, made by Vogel for the contribution of many props in our studio, and our platinum sponsor, Harry's Construction, for their ongoing support of Joy in the City. Once a month, we are highlighting a native restaurant in our community, which still exists today. Finelli's Italian Villa has been in this area for over 38 years and is a well-known Italian eatery. Today, Teresa Miller sits down with them to discuss the history and the significance of Finelli's. I want to thank you guys for being with us today. Um, we're going to highlight your business and talk about the history behind your, your business. Uh, Mr. Finelli, I want you to share with us how you acquired the building because around here we are no stranger to acquiring old buildings and turning them into things. So I want you to share your story. In 1983, the Dutch Kitchen is what our restaurant was called. It burnt uh, so that it couldn't be fixed. Um, there was questions whether it was arson or whatever. I did not own it at that time. Okay, the place sat empty for a number of years. Uh, in 83, the owner was going to have it tore down because City Hall was saying this abandoned building just can't sit still like this. Okay, so I said to her, did you strike it rich? Where are you going to get the money? Because no checks were being issued because of the arson. They thought it was arson. Uh, so they had to, in order for her to get a check, they had to prove that it, uh, either arson or not and then the insurance company would issue. Anyway, she... Uh, she said, I have to have a tour down because the city is bothering me. I can't sit at Bandit like this anymore. I said, I have an idea. Why don't you give it to me? And she questioned that and said, what do you mean give it to you? I said, give it to me for free. She said, I still owe a little bit of taxes on it. Pay the taxes and give me a clear title. I did. She did. I'm sorry. Well, when she did that, I thought, well, this will be a walk in the park because my dad's involved in City Hall and vacant properties. So I got it, and we started working on it. It was three stories that were burnt. Uh, and everybody said, what are you doing? I said, we're going to make a restaurant. Hey, you're crazy. That's, you can't turn, turn this into a restaurant. <laughs> this is a pile of ashes. I said, no, we're going to turn it into a restaurant. Well, that dream anyway took uh, about 10 years. I don't think we could have made City Hall any matter. Okay, but the fact of the matter is, I always relate to that like a lady having a baby. You go through a lot of pain, but you forget that pain real quick. So after 10 years, we finally opened in 93 in November. Here we are 28 years later. So you always had the intentions of making that a restaurant. That yes, was always from the there. beginning, yes. From the beginning. James Cagney once said in one of his late movies, every man needs his own playground. So here we have it. <laughs> so were you a cook? Were you a chef at that time? Well, we were going to learn how to do that. There was no cooks or chefs or anything like that at the time. Uh, you know, Tony was a young, young man, junior high, high school probably, early years. And, you know, I lived across the alley. So, you know, come on. You're done playing ball for today. Now you're going to come over and help Dad. Hey, uh, I don't know what thoughts he had at that time. <laughs> but anyway, it was a family thing, and everybody kind of just stuck with it and figured, let's make his dream happen. Uh, he's a fantastic chef today, probably the best in the area. And that's dad talking, okay? But I think a lot of people will agree with me on that. Uh, his sister makes the martinis. She's, she runs the bar. She's a beverage manager. And my wife does all the desserts, works in front of the house with me, and we're all living happily ever after. It's so a, it's been a family affair from day from the beginning, one. Yes. Day one, and it stayed that way. Yes. Yes. Now, Tony, did you go to school to be a chef, or no. you just learned as no, you went? self-taught. Uh -huh. uh, a lot of trips to the library back in the day. Uh, you know, we'd start to do special events, and i say, I'm going to cook some Cajun food for a Mardi Gras. He goes, what do you know about cooking Cajun food? I said, well, nothing. I'm going to go learn, though. The library's so, right up the street. You know, I live yeah. two blocks from the library, <laughs> so it was really easy. Go up, and then just, you know, find a couple recipes, add my own stuff here and there to it. 
and uh, a lot of successful events uh, that we've had over the years with just uh, trial, and, trial and error on us, you know, for the food, um, you know, because, um, you know, there's no, since I'm not classically trained as a chef, I can take, um, you know, a, little, a few more um, chances on what I'm going to try. So but we try to, try to stri stick strictly to Italian, you know, classic Italian, which we do. A lot of the recipes we have are from, my, from his mother and her mother, you know, my great-grandmother and grandmother. Uh, you know, so the sauce, a lot of the couple of different the different dishes that we have, uh, you know, they go back into the uh, Italian, you know, uh, heritage where we're from in, in Italy and stuff like that. So we do a lot of veal, which is a lot, you know, big in Italian uh, culture and stuff like that and the culinary. So, um, but as to be trained, no, I went to school for accounting at Duquesne University. <laughs> wow. Yeah, far cry wow. from culinary yes. what I'm doing today. Yes. That... yes, and everybody says, would you ever go back to being an accountant? I said, no. I've been doing this for almost 28 years now. So I love every day is different. Uh, it's a new challenge. You never know what to expect. You know, and you love the people that come through the door. You it, know? It's more of a passion, okay, than it is a job. <clears throat> we love everybody. The Fidelis love what we do. We love what we do. I... I interviewed another restaurant owner this morning, and I feel that the common denominator is that you guys and this other fellow, you love people. He loves mm -hmm. people, and it sounds like you guys like, Absolutely. Yeah. love people oh, and yeah, serving people. And I, 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 The I, pandemic, I didn't know what to do. I had nobody to talk to. <laughs> we were doing to-goes. <laughs> right. Okay? So, yeah, there's no people. Well, that's my next yeah. question is how did you navigate through unprecedented times? They were tough times on restaurant I'm owners. I'm going to let Anthony yeah. answer that because just, re, he reinvented us. Well, you know, with the pandemic, we're primarily known as a sit-down restaurant. Not a lot of takeout prior to the pandemic. So when that started, it was kind of a challenge for us and me and the family and everything. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? So I said, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to readjust the menu. We're going to put on some stuff that uh, is more of a takeout item. So we readjusted that, and I put these salads on. Um, that was the second. The first thing I did was last summer I did a thing called a seafood boil, which you don't really hear around here. It had pound of little neck clams, mussels, crab legs, uh, smoked andouille sausages. They, they took off. We couldn't keep them in stock every day. I, did, I, mean, I was ordering food. I was getting my food trucks every two days to try to keep in stock the amount of seafood I was going through with these. But you had to reinvent yourself for people to come pick it up and take it out because we weren't used to that. So with that, after that, you know, after the summer was ended, I said, we're going to do something else now. Now what do we do? And I put salads on the menu, which we never had a salad, you know, a typical um, central PA salad with French fries. And, uh, you know, whether it's over protein you're going to put on there, whether it be shrimp or chicken or steak or whatever it's going to be. So I said, what we're going to do is we're going to make ours, uh, you know, a little more, not higher end. We're going we're gonna to load it up with a bunch of ingredients. So I created the loaded salads at Finale's, which have took off and have kept us even going, even to this day. We have so much more takeout now than when we did prior to the pandemic. And I think that opened us up to a whole new clientele also that didn't even know that we existed before that because of the salads, you know. So now we see them ordering salads and our entrees to go for the takeout. So it was a, it was a challenge, but we, went, we made, through, made it through very, very well, I believe. You know? And do you feel like um, your regular people tried even harder to support you guys and to keep you going doing during those times. Absolutely, I can yeah. answer yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, they were, they were great. <clears throat> yeah. They were. They just wanted to make sure that you got through this. When the pandemic started last March, we were only supposed to be closed for two weeks. Uh, I uh, said uh, we also started remodeling the outside, which everybody only got to work three days. We restuccoed the outside and the new rubber roof, uh, it, but the construction all had to halt after three days. Uh, so we went inside while the pandemic was going on and redid everything on the inside of the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And then they, after the pandemic eased up a little bit, they were able to come back and finish the exterior. So it was a good time for, we were closed for six months. Yeah. And while, while we were closed, we were doing the to-goes. Yeah. And the, the seafood thing that he was talking about that we do, uh, you couldn't go on vacation last year. So our slogan on Facebook was, we're bringing the shore to our door. <laughs> nice, yeah. nice. And a lot of our clientele would show up and, and support us uh, tremendously through this. And they said their one thing is we want to make sure that you're here after the pandemic because yeah. we love coming here so much. 
So that was another thing that we had a lot of people support us. People were great through that. Yeah, they are. Just and I'm glad us. to hear that. I'm yeah. really glad to hear that. Um, and it kind of put you in a season where your your goals kind of shift shifted from. Absolutely. You know. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. Now, you're not a big corporate food chain. How do you get your name out there? How do you draw people in? That's probably mostly been word of mouth or Facebook. Um, we get a lot of out of towners. Well, you don't get a lot of because a, a lot of travelers now, but we're the number one restaurant in the area on TripAdvisor. Uh, matter of fact, we're a Hall of Famer with TripAdvisor. Very rare. All right, and they're throughout the world. TripAdvisor is throughout the world. So, so we're pretty proud of that. Yes. And people yes. come into restaurants and say, hey, I saw the reviews on TripAdvisor. We want to see if this is real. Yeah, and we talked about your your photos on Facebook. Yeah, look exactly yeah. what like what you get. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. kind of odd because just about two weeks ago, I can't remember if it was a TripAdvisor review or some review, but a lady actually put on one of our reviews that she goes she was so happy because she saw all these photos on the internet, and when she actually came in to get the food, she was just so surprised that the dish looked exactly like it did on Facebook. So you know, I don't. There's no doctoring of any photos or anything like that. So you know, we give the you know. Best quality ingredients that we have available to us, we pass on to our customers. Now, I've never been to Finelli's, but I am going to make it a point okay. to do that. <laughs> so, I'm coming in. Yes. I don't know anything about your menu. Okay. What do I want to try first? Well, if you're not, if you're going to pass on the appetizer, you definitely want to try the Caesar salad. Okay. Caesar salad is by far one of our biggest complimented uh, items that is on our menu. Because we actually still make it the classic style with the wooden bowl, and we mash the garlic and the anchovies and the olive and the olive oil and the red wine vinegar, and we make every Caesar salad to order fresh. It doesn't come out There's of a no bottle. Caesar dressing. Yeah, the, the dressing it's made. Yeah, the dressing doesn't come out of a bottle. It doesn't come out of a jug. Every dressing is made fresh to order on each Caesar salad. So you definitely want to start with that. Um, you know, if you want an appetizer. Uh, one of our biggest one, and that we're probably most well known for that we've had since the beginning, are our drunken mushrooms, and that is you know it's a mushroom and a brandy cream sauce that is just fantastic that everybody seems to enjoy. Nice. So, no, so when I come in there, you're gonna. That will take care of you. I guess I will lead you down the right path. Right. Right. Okay. I will lead you down the culinary path. I'm gonna of ask for you. Okay. Yes. Great. Yes. Great. Well, guys, I have had so much fun getting to know you guys yes. and um, kind of talking about all these things. And I just really, really appreciate you guys showing up today. I know Thank you're you busy. Thank you. We appreciate Being it. a business We're, owner, you work day in, day out, every day. Yeah. So for you to do this for me, I really, really appreciate that. We're more than glad to be here. Yeah, we Thank you. Take time Thank out. you. Yep. Take time out for everybody. Try to make, try to give, try to give our love for the business to pass it on to the the people. That's what we enjoy Very doing. Good. I like it. Thanks. So. You're welcome. If you have a personal story or a testimony that you would be willing to share with our community, we would love to chat with you about it. Please contact us at 814-944-1948 or by email at stories at jointhecity.org. Today's platinum sponsor is Harry's Construction, whose motto is, if you can dream it, we can create it. Recently opening Harry's Construction Kitchen and Bath Center so you, the consumer, can see examples of the variety of services provided by the team at Harry's Construction. Regardless of the project size, Harry's team approaches each project as if it is his own home. Be sure to visit Harry's Construction Kitchen and Bath Center at 114 Main Street in Bellwood. You can also visit their website to see pictures of home improvement projects over the years. Thanks again to Harry Halk and the team for supporting Joy in the City. Made by Vogel is a father and son business that produces high quality handmade wooden products such as cutting boards, bowls, bottle stoppers and more. Products for sale can be found on their Etsy site or in downtown Altoona at the Clay Cup. You can't go wrong buying from Made by Vogel. 
Today, we will hear from Reverend Dr. Peter Jowdry as he answers another tough question. Why does it seem that sometimes my prayers go unanswered? Well, when I first saw that question, I said to myself, um, there's probably some times when I'm glad, ultimately, that my prayers didn't get answered. So we have to kind of take a long view of answered prayer. Um, there, there have been times when I prayed some things I'm glad God didn't respond in the affirmative because then ultimately I would have been hurt and probably those around me would have been hurt. So that's the first thing I want to say. And secondly, I, th I think I want to say this, that, that when we pray, we're coming into agreement not with our own agenda, but with God's. So what God confines Himself to do is He confines Himself to uh, cooperate and partner with us in prayer. And sometimes we use a phrase that says, God can't if we won't. So God can't do something if we won't partner with Him. But if we will partner with Him, He will intervene on our behalf. And how do we partner with God? We partner with God by praying. And so when we talk about praying, then I want to be sure that what I'm praying is in fact what He would want me to pray. And so sometimes I'm praying things, and one of the, the scripture writers uses the term amiss, which is a, um, uh, a King James for, word that basically says we're, we're asking with impure motives. We're asking with motives that are about me and not about Him. So sometimes God doesn't answer our prayer because it's all about us. When ultimately a, a mature view of praying is, God, what is your will? What do you want to see happen? What, what is your agenda here? And how can I come along and cooperate with your agenda and see you move in a, in a powerful way? So I think it's really important for us to, to pray. Jesus said, he taught his disciples to, to pray. He said, pray that, God, your kingdom come, your will be done. But frankly, I quite often pray, God, I'm not really con too concerned about your kingdom. I want my will to be done. Sure. So, so the first principle we want to talk about in praying is, is, what does God want to happen? And am I in agreement with God's agenda? That's the first thing. The second thing is this. In Luke chapter 18, you have this little editorial phrase inserted by Luke that basically says, Jesus told this parable so his disciples would learn that they should always pray and not give up. So that they should always pray and not give up. That's the whole point of the parable. And then the parable goes on to describe a man who wouldn't give the poor widow justice. Well, much of our praying is short-lived, it's very temporary, it's very short-sighted, uh, it lasts for an issue that I'm having for today, it lasts for an issue I'm having for a week or a month, and then we give up and say, well, I guess God's not going to do anything. When God actually calls us to persevere in prayer, we've all heard about knock and the door shall be opened. We've all heard about seek and you shall find, ask and you will receive. But when you look at the, the original there, it's knock and keep on knocking. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Don't just simply, uh, you know, kind of say, well, I'm hoping that God does this, but if He doesn't, I guess I'll just give it. No, there's a lot of perseverance that takes place in our prayer life. So the first one is to determine what God's will is. The second one is to say, God, not only am I determining that this is your will, but I'm not going to let go until you come and meet me and answer this prayer, which is in accordance with the will of the Father. So in a culture where everything is push-button response, uh, how, how do you talk to people, how do you uh, counsel people to, to wait when they, they pray and if there's not a response within 24 hours, we just say, well, it must not be God's will. I mean, how do we, we guide people in those situations when we want such an immediate response? Well, we don't microwave prayer, and many try to do that. That's the first thing. Um, and you're quite right. We live in a culture that doesn't do well with the dark night of the soul, to use St. John of the Cross's words in the 1500s. We don't do well with the idea of waiting on God, of resting in Him, of allowing Him to work in us. It's interesting. Oftentimes we use this phrase, which I kind of categorically uh, deny, but I'll explain that in a second. We use this phrase, prayer changes things. 
uh, I would argue that prayer doesn't change things. Prayer changes us. Um, I have a friend who just went through a 40-day fast. He said probably one of the greatest th things that happened in the 40-day fast of his life was obviously the things that God did in him. But he said rather than ending the 40 days and saying, aren't I really spiritual and aren't you not too spiritual because you didn't for fast 40 days and some of us can't fast 40 hours, you know, so, you know, aren't I better than you? He said it actually brought a more, a deeper sense of humility of how much I needed God and how much I need Him in my life. And so when I pray, I, I come to a realization that I'm not in this just to see this situation change, but God is in this to actually change me. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that we use this phrase, prayer changes things, and I said I, I deny that. I would say that prayer changes nothing. It is God who changes things. When I'm going to Disney World, or is it Disneyland? I think it's Disney World in Florida. Uh, one's in California, one's in Florida. I Florida is Disney World. Disney World. So when I'm going to Disney World, and I'm on the I-95 coming south or the I-75 coming south, and I hit I-4, which you know kind of goes across uh, Florida, I don't worship the highways and say, isn't this wonderful? Oh. These highways have really given us an amazing vacation. No, it's the destination I want. It's getting to Disney. That's what I want. And many people will, will praise prayer. I don't praise prayer. I praise the God who answers my prayer. And so when we talk about prayer changing things, of course, I understand what people say. We need to pray. But prayer in and of itself is not the thing that changes things. It is the God of heaven who hears and answers prayer, and He changes things, and He intervenes, and He responds to me in prayer. So I don't praise, I don't praise the highway that gets me there. I praise the one who is at the end of the highway, God Himself, and say He is the answer. Because you know what, what happens is we actually start to say, well, I prayed, therefore God, therefore my prayer was answered because I prayed. No, I, my, my prayer was answered because God moved. My prayer is, was answered because He's a miracle-working God. That's why I pray. So early on, you had mentioned about God's will. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. we just want our will, but we need to align with God's will. The, the mindset that, well, God's will is going to happen, so why do we even pray? God, God's going to make it happen one way or the other, what His will is, so what's the necessity for prayer? Well, first of all, God's will will not happen unless we pray. There are many things that have not happened because God's people didn't pray. Conversely, there are many things that did happen that wouldn't have happened had God's people been praying. I'm absolutely convinced of that. History belongs to the intercessors. History belongs to people who pray. The people who pray turn history for themselves personally, for their families, for their churches, for their communities. Those communities that choose not to pray and by the way, it, it, there's a great dearth of prayer in the church today. There's a lot of what I call now I lay me down to sleep type prayers, you know, where people just kind of go through a rote, rote prayer. But history belongs to the intercessor. And you'll find where people prayed, things change. Somebody says, well, you know, it's a coincidence that that happened. You prayed and coincidentally that happened, therefore you feel like your prayers were answered. But it's really just a coincidence. And somebody else responded by saying what? Well, I just find the more I pray, the more coincidences there are. Right? So... In this case, uh, there are lots of things that didn't happen or did happen, and it was because God's people didn't pray. And it leads me to another axiom that I'm not very comfortable with that I kind of will oftentimes say to congregations and watch their face kind of uh, pull back. I often will say, God is not in control. And, of course, we love to say God's in control, don't we? Indeed. Uh, well, I'm afraid he's not always in control because he's given man, he's given humanity um, a measure of control over their own destiny. And what are we saying about God when we say, God, you're in control, but that young girl was abused or that marriage fell apart 
or that horrific car crash took place. What are we saying about God if God is in control? No, what we say is God is sovereign and ultimately He will, the kingdoms of this world will become and will be subsumed to the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, but He gives us a measure of our own control. And so as I begin to pray and pray in alignment with the will of God, He comes along and changes the destiny of my situation or my family's or my, you know, and, and as I pray, God does that. But friends, let me just make clear, Pastor Troy, you know this as well as I know, that there are times we didn't pray about things we wish we had because we didn't um, carry out the mandate to pray without ceasing, to keep pressing in, to keep persevering, to not give up. And it's not the praying that gets us there, it's God who makes it happen. You know, this was this is exactly what I was looking for. Thank you for taking us into a deeper understanding of uh, the question of my prayers. Are they valuable? Why aren't they answered? So on and so forth. I think that this is something that all believers, whether you've been a, a following of Christ for two weeks or 20 years, some of the things that we go through and wrestle with. And so thank you for digging into this with me today. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Kick off summer by joining faith-filled believers from all across the city for Saturate Altoona. This is a free summer worship series unifying believers throughout our community. You're invited to join worshipers every Sunday night during the month of June at Heritage Plaza beginning at 6.30 p.m. You'll hear from 12 different faith leaders of several denominations and musicians from many churches. You don't want to miss Saturate Altoona every Sunday night in June at Heritage Plaza in downtown Altoona. If you're not watching Around the Alleghenies, the series, you're missing a lot. You need to walk that straight line. It's not straight. We try to do everything we can to help other families have the same outcome as us. I think it's awesome because you're actually riding a piece of history. I've never photographed a snake. <laughs> it is so easy and so much more cost effective to make your own pancake mix. Baby boomers are doing remodels so that they can age in their home longer. This was a picture frame picture or a mirror frame? frame? Gosh, this could be really fun to try to do this, you know, as a duo. Oh. This little sidewalk became my stepping stone. You know, the Bill Murray movie Groundhog Day? Yes. Uh, it's been like that pretty much every day for a year. Watch Around the Alleghenies, weekdays at 12.30 on ABC 23, and weeknights after Fox 8 News at 10. That's all the time we have today. Thank you for watching Joy in the City, True Stories. Let me encourage you to watch other episodes of people and organizations having an impact on our community on ABC 23 at 5.30 a.m. and 12.30 p.m. every Sunday. You can also catch us each week on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Until then, be encouraged because God is moving in our city.